feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Wait.
Dear Lord, we come before you today and we ask that no matter where we are, Lord, if we're in our house or if we're at our family's house or wherever we might be, Lord, when we find ourselves watching this um, video, God, we ask that you'll just move in our hearts and you'll move in our homes and then you can use our homes and our hearts to move our nation, God. We ask that you'll bring healing to the world that we live in, God, and we ask that you'll just um, use us as a light in this dark time, God. We're so grateful that even through all of this, you still sit on the throne and your son still died to save our sins. God, we ask all this in your name. Amen. If you got your Bibles, open up your copy to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 is where we're going to be hanging out today, looking at Jesus and, and the greatness of Jesus as we've um, been doing it the past couple of weeks, of course, leading up to Easter. We always talk about the Easter story. We always talk about Jesus, but we've been talking about some of the basics. And um, we talked about the basics of, uh, of Scripture and following God's Word. And, and now we're going to continue into the basics of just understanding who Jesus truly is. How Jesus is truly the greatest and how he proved his greatness through what he did for us on the cross. Um, the, the act of the cross was the greatest feat ever ever accomplished by any man. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to you. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to this world. And where we pick up, we're going to see that um, in Hebrews that some people have gotten away from that greatness of Christ. And we're going to we're going to look at why, and we're going to see um, uh, even in our own lives today who we see as the greatest and, and how we should put things in proper context. You know, because everybody wants to be the greatest. You know, you think about that. Everybody wants to be wants to be great. We see that in everyday life. We can go back to um, one of the greatest boxers of all time. I say one of the greatest boxers of all time because people can make claims that they're better boxers than this guy. But we see Muhammad Ali standing in the middle of a ring screaming, I am the greatest. Um, some of you young folks may not remember this, but back when I was a kid during baseball, there was a Ricky Henderson. Ricky Henderson was a great baseball player, but one of the things that Ricky Henderson was really good at was stealing bases. The man was fast, but I remember at one game, he, he broke the record for stolen bases, and he went, he stole second base, and he went, and he, he took second base, lifted it up over his head, and somebody stuck a microphone in his, face, in his face, and he said, today, I am the greatest of all time. That's a pretty bold claim to make about yourself. Now, um, he, he became the greatest of all time at that point, but still, that's, that's, that, that's a total lack of humility. It was kind of comical when you watch it now, how he proclaimed that. And some of you young kids out there, you know, I had the argument with of who's the greatest basketball player of all time. Um, you know, we take out some of the greats of the, the far past, but we always want to argue on who's the greatest. Michael Jordan or LeBron, and this this is um, it's coming to the forefront again now because you've got Michael Jordan coming out with this documentary. You got um, um, Kobe Bryant just passing away, so he's entered into the conversation, and then you got LeBron James who claims that he's the greatest. Um, in my opinion, in my summation, you look at the records, you look at all the things, the accomplishments, and everything that's happened. There's no doubt that Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. He transcended the game of basketball. Probably one of the greatest athletes to ever play in a sport. Um, and, and people would make the argument against that, but I believe the body of work is there that Michael Jordan would be the greatest of all time. Some of y'all are sitting there and you may be thinking, Brother Johnny's done lost his mind because he don't even compare to LeBron. And we can have these arguments back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, just about anything. But as we look at all these things, we put all these things together. We see that this conversation has happened forever. Even the disciples got into a little bit of a, a an argument, if you will. Um, they got into a, um, a conversation, walking down the road. You know, you're like, I'm, I'm, you know who's going to be greatest? I'm going to be great. You're, you're not, I'm, I'm going to be greatest. I mean, who do you think is going to be great? And then Jesus walked up on them. They're like, what are y'all talking about? And, and they're like, I'm, you know, nothing. I mean, you know, we weren't talking about nothing. I mean, we just... It's, it's, it's a nice day today, Jesus. You know, they, they didn't want him to know exactly what they were talking about. And Jesus gives them this speech about how who's going to be the greatest. But also, um, unless you become like one of these, talking about little children, you ain't getting into heaven anyway. Talking about being humble. Um, talking about um, uh, having the, 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 the mind of a child and, and the faith of a child when it comes to spiritual things. And so um, they, they had to begin to understand what Jesus was talking about and, and to understand that, you know what? 
this argument that we're having really is silly. And sometimes we'll do that in, in our work, or we'll get to thinking like that, you know, uh, at your workplace. You're like, I'm, I'm, I'm a better worker than all these people. I'm the greatest when it comes to this. I'm the best when it comes to that. But in reality, we've all got things that God has given us and gifted us to do, and, and, and we don't need to worry about that because when it comes down to it, if you want to talk about who is the greatest, who is the best, who, who's the greatest of all time, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And, and when it comes down to it, all this other stuff that we, we like to argue about or talk about or, or think about ourselves about, when it comes down to it, what we really ought to be trying to, to do is be the greatest servant of Jesus of all time and not worry about who's the greatest of all time because that is him. But here's the deal. Some of you probably already maybe amen. Um, your, your computer screen or your phone. And if I was to say that Jesus, Jesus Christ is the greatest, all of God's people would say, hey man, yeah, you know, I, I did this in a church sermon one time, man. sitting in a church service, surrounded with people a lot, unlike what I'm doing today. But as, um, you know, as I said that in the middle of a, of a service, I said, Jesus is the greatest of all time. And then I said, is he? Everybody's like, yeah, amen. Jesus is great. Like, amen. And then I said, is he? And some people were offended by that. But like, well, what kind of preacher are you that would question whether or not Jesus would be the greatest of all time? And I followed it up with that, with this. Does our lives reflect that statement? Does our lives reflect that amen? Jesus is the greatest of all time. Amen. What about tomorrow? <laughs> what about Tuesday? Wednesday, he, he, he establishes greatness again as long as there's nothing else in the way, you know. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, is he? Sunday, amen. We got to get to the point where Jesus is looked at as the greatest of all time. No matter what the situation, no matter what the time of year, no matter where we find ourselves, we have to understand and we have to proclaim that Jesus is the greatest. Past couple of weeks, it's been kind of easy because there's nothing to compete. There's nothing to compete with the fact that Jesus is the greatest. But I, I'm, I'm here to tell you, if, if we didn't, we weren't going through a pandemic right now, would he be? Would he be the greatest in your life? Would he be the most important thing? Would you be tuning in to um, church services two times a week? Would you be coming to church two times a week? Or would Wednesday nights get swallowed up by something else? Would Bible study time get swallowed up by something else? Would Sunday mornings get swallowed up by something else? So in your life, is Jesus the greatest? In Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to see a clear argument that Jesus is the greatest. All throughout the book of Hebrews, we see a pretty clear argument that Jesus was the greatest. Um, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, verses 1 through 5, it says this. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. He is the radiance of his glory, the exact expression of his nature, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, praise God, he made purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became higher in rank than the angels just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we love you. We thank you and we praise you for all you do. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who is the greatest, without a doubt, the greatest. Father, we thank you for that. Lord, be with our time together. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we see here is that Jesus is greater than the angels. That's what the Hebrew writer starts talking about right here. In this day, um, we see him tell the people that, that Jesus is the greatest, greater than the angels. But why? You see, the Jews believed the angels to be great and held them in high esteem. 
Um, uh, but the problem with the Christians of that day is this. They had lived through persecutions and, and were dealing with hard times, and it was easy for them to revert to what was easy, what was natural, what they knew. We see this very thing with Peter when Jesus was gone. Peter went back to doing what was easy, what was good, what he knew. You know, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He still hasn't gone. Uh, he has, hasn't ascended into heaven yet, but we see the disciples back in Galilee. They're having a conversation, and uh, everybody's kind of looking around like, what y'all going to do now? I don't know what you're going to do. And Peter's like, I'm going fishing. Peter went back to what was normal. Peter went back to what was comfortable. Peter went back to what he understood, okay? Um, and for the Christians that were former Jews of this time, talking about when the book of Hebrews was written, for the Christians that were former Jews of this time, what, what would you think? At this point, nobody's really hurting the Jews. That I mean, it, Jews have an easier life than they do. I mean, the Jews have been under Roman occupation and, and, and some things have gone down, you know, um, Nero did some stuff. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But, but for the most part, the Jews have banded together with a lot of the pagans and other people and were persecuting the Christians. And the Christians are like, where's all this coming from? I didn't have to deal with this. I mean, we, we were under Roman persecution, but it wasn't near this bad. Nobody was actually killing us um, back, back in those days. A, a, everything was, was, was still okay for the most part. Many times the Jews that did the persecution and having the Christians arrested, um, you know, we, we see them. We see that they were the ones that stoned Stephen to death. The Jewish world is persecuting the Christians and the pagan world is too. We talk about Nero. You know, we had that Roman persecution, but when they had the Jews living in, um, and the Christians went to, to Rome, rather, and, and as they were in Rome, Nero hated the Christians, so he set Rome on fire, blamed it on the Christians, and then people were pouring out all kinds of wrath and evil against the Christians, and the Jews were seeing this, they were like, I don't want to be part of that, and some of the Christians were seeing that, and were like, I don't want to be part of that, they're not bothering the Jews, I'll go back to being a Jew. That's where we see Peter writing in 1 Peter that, that, that we have in our Bibles. At this point, you know, James had been martyred um, and how fitting because his mom was one of the ones who approached Jesus and was like, which one of my sons will be the greatest in the kingdom? To which Jesus replied, unless you're willing to do what I do, then it doesn't matter what you think. You know, no, you're not going to be the greatest in heaven. Peter has been crucified and nine other disciples are dead at this point when we're looking at in Hebrews. That number includes Judas and Paul. Um, six of the dead were believed to have been killed in the year 70 AD, which is right around the time the book of Hebrews is written. The thoughts of the people were, if this faith is so awesome, then why is everybody dying? Why is everybody being killed? Why is everybody being martyred? It was increasingly hard to be a Christian with very little earthly reward. This is the reasoning behind the message. This is the reasoning for, for, for writing of the book. They wanted to establish that Jesus was greater than the angels. Don't worship them. Worship him. But not just an angel. The writer is declaring that he's greater than everybody. We see in chapter 3 that he tells that he's greater than Moses. In chapter 4, he's greater than Joshua. In chapters 4 through 6, he's greater than the high priest. In chapter 7, he's greater than Melchizedek. In, in, um, in, in 6 and 7, he's greater than Abraham. In 7 through 8, it's Aaron and the other priests. The old covenant and the sacrifices are talked about in 8 through 10. Basically, they have broken down every tenet of what they'd be going back to for the Jewish people. And they're showing them that what Jesus did was better. That Jesus was greater than Moses and the prophets. Than the old covenant. Jesus was the greatest. And for us, that's what we've got to believe. We've got to believe that Jesus was greater. If you believe the Bible, if you believe John chapter 1 and verse 1, then you must believe that Jesus was there when all these people were created. And Jesus was leading when all this stuff was happening. And if you believe that Jesus is God, which we do, then you would have to believe that Jesus was God here on earth and created these people. And if you were a Jew that had become a Christian, now there would be no question to who Jesus is, to who Jesus was. There'd be no question that he was the greatest, greater than every hero that the Jewish nation had ever known. It was brought to them in a way that they could understand. But what about us today? See, we look at them and we look at the Christians and we look at the Christians who were saved as Jews. And, and just to clarify everything, 
Lots of Jews became Christians. And now, through efforts um, of the Jews, through efforts of, of persecution, through whatever effort that, that Satan could, could bring about, he was trying to turn the Christians back to the Jews. He was trying to eliminate the thought of Jesus. He wanted it done away with. And he was being successful to some point. And so the writer of Hebrews is breaking this down. But, but let's say that today, what if today there was a new revelation? What is, what is he greater than today? You know, times are a bit different now. But Jesus, um, uh, the, the message of Jesus still goes on. And the message of Hebrews is still the same for us, even though it's changed a bit in context. We aren't in danger of worshiping angels. We aren't in danger of worshiping the apostles. We aren't in danger of going back to our Jewish roots. So what are we in danger of today? I believe if God came and brought a revelation for us today, you know what I believe? I believe that we're in danger of. I believe that we're in the most danger of worshiping ourselves. We put ourselves so high up on these pedestals. Um, we, we put um, our, our family so high up on these pedestals. We put our children so high up on these pedestals that, that we begin to worship people and ourselves. Not the things that were going on back then. And so we have to fight against that. We have to recognize it. We have to attack it. And we have to fight against that. Because we have a whole new threat of dangers. You know, I believe that we're one of the most complacent generations ever when it comes to the things of the gospel and the things of Jesus. We're just like, you know, it's all good. Everybody's going to make it to heaven and, and, and we're all going to be in peace and harmony there. We stop talking about sin so much. We stop talking about God's wrath so much. We stop talking about um, that God is going to be um, judging us and that when he judges us that we're not going to be able to talk him um, out of casting us into hell we, we we just water everything down and we're just like it's it we're just we're just happy go lucky because everything's gonna work out because you know what everything always works out it just feels like everything comes together and works out in our favor but that's not the real world and that's that's not um that, that that's not what's really happening we've become like the old testament Our senses have become dulled. It's almost as if we push the Holy Spirit's voice out of our heart. We know from the Old Testament that when there was no leader, that the people did what was right in their own minds. In Judges chapter 17, verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did which was right in his own eyes. In Proverbs chapter 14, and verse 12, it says, There is a way which seemed right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You see, the state of Christianity today is returned to the same condition that Israel was in. During the time of Judges, this statement in Judges is not a positive statement about Israel, but a negative one. The sin of doing that which is right in their own eyes was accounted for the sin of Micah and continuing idol worship. Um, there, there were no judges in the land to point out their sin or restrain the people from it. The law of God had been forsaken and replaced with subjectivism. What happens is this. When we don't allow God to be the ruler of our heart, than we are. And we've become satisfied in that role. We're satisfied to overlook sin. If it means our political party can win, I mean, I, I don't see no sin over there. We're not electing a pastor. We're, we're electing a president. We're not electing a pastor. We're electing a governor. And so we'll vote for whoever it is and whatever they do, we'll vote for Satan himself if he ran on the, um, the, the, the ticket that we thought we wanted to vote for. Overlooking sin and overlooking the debauchery that's going on. We're satisfied to watch whatever we want on TV because, well, you know, I got to do something. I mean, I got to pass the time on something and this is the only thing that's on. I know it's all bad, but I mean, we got to watch something. It's entertaining. It'll get us through the pandemic. But when it comes down to it, it's, it's, it we, we can't do that. We can't just overlook this stuff and, and, and call it good. We act if it's, as if sin is cute and we watch it and we practice it. In a few months, we'll get ready for our flu shots. I know we're just coming on spring, but 
I mean, four or five months down the road, we'll be getting into flu season and we'll be getting flu shots. And every year, we've got a great partnership with the people of Greenbrier Pharmacy and they'll come to church and you give them a little bit of insurance information if you got insurance and, and you go in there and you get your flu shot. You get you get your um, vaccination, if you will. I got a feeling that coming up pretty soon, we'll be getting vaccinated for more than just the flu. You know, maybe we'll have a, a COVID-19 vaccine. But here's the thing. Um, wh what we do when we get that flu shot, and most of you know this, is that they take just a little bit of the flu and they inject it into your body. And, and so when they put that little bit of flu in your body, then your immune system, it goes and attacks it. And then it's like, okay, this is, this is, this is something new. This is, a, this is the flu and, and, and we've got to be prepared to fight this if it ever comes into the body again. So your body builds up this immunity. And then when you, um, when you are exposed to the flu, your body's like, I know exactly what this is. Let's go kill it. Let's go get it out. You know, um, so we just get just enough of the flu that we never really catch the flu. And I'm afraid that's what happens to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm afraid that that's gonna be happening over and over again as we see um, people being exposed to the gospel, people hearing the gospel, people hearing about Jesus. And, and, and especially in the South, you know, if you can live in the South and never get exposed to Jesus just a little bit, then, um, then you have to be living under a rock or something because even now it, it's everywhere. But what we got to be careful is, is that we don't just get vaccinated with the gospel, that we get totally consumed with the gospel. That we get drenched with the gospel. But we've been successfully vaccinating people with the gospel for quite some time. We've gotten a little bit of Jesus. We got a little bit of him, and it's just enough for us to never really catch him. But you see, the uh, Jesus vaccine leaves us vulnerable. There are side effects. You know, there's always side effects to these drugs. Uh, a lot of times, if you watch the full commercial for a drug, or if you read the fine print at the bottom of the screen, it says some pretty crazy things. Most always, it has something to do with the digestive system, um, you know, and um, those instructions will go real, real fast where it says if you take this drug, you'll grow hair on the bottom of your feet. It may cause abdominal pain. You're probably going to have to wear a diaper. Don't wear white pants ever, even if it's on Memorial Day. <laughs> There's side effects to a Jesus vaccination. You see, if we catch just a little bit of Jesus, we're going to catch a whole load of sin. We got to have the whole thing. A little bit of Jesus does not cure sin sickness. It doesn't prevent lying and cheating and stealing. Uh, uh, when, when we have just a little bit of Jesus, our politicians become greater. Our teams become greater. Our houses and our cars become greater. Our children become greater. And the next thing we know is we have an epidemic on our hands and it's spreading like wildfire. It's the worst inside the church. We come in every week and we get a weekly booster shot. Then we go out and we live like the world for the rest of the week. We'll stand up for sin as long as our culture and community stands with us. Amen? I mean, come on. Let's, uh, let's go back in time 75 years. You know what the culture in the South said 75 years ago? That it was okay to hate somebody. Even people inside the church said it was okay to hate somebody because of their race. Sometimes we agree with our culture and we agree with our community to the point that we, we think we're fine because we got our little Jesus vaccination over here and instead we're sin sick almost to the point of death. Think about 75 years ago. Where would you have stood if somebody sat in your seat on the bus? 75 years ago, where would you have stood if somebody used your bathroom or drank from your water fountain? I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm afraid that there's a lot of people then that were just vaccinated and they weren't in tune with the truth. They got just enough Jesus to make them feel like they were safe. We've got to quit being vaccinated by the gospel and get infected with it. We've got to stop telling God no 
and that he has no say in our lives. And because we've done this for so long that he said, all right, that's fine. If that's what you want, you can have it. Then, then we look at what happened to the people of Israel when, when they were without a king, and without a pastor. Everyone did what was right in their own minds. And that's a dangerous place to be. When we push him out and tell them he doesn't have a say, we forfeit his conviction on our lives. And if we're being honest, there's been times in our lives where we forfeited God's conviction in our lives such a scary and dangerous place to be but it's a place that we live sometimes but what I've learned is that the absence of conviction is the absence of true happiness some of you say well I mean uh, what does that even mean how, how could you say that the absence of conviction is the absence of happiness and what I mean by that is is I'm much more happy when God has a say in my life than I am when I don't allow him to have a say in my life. When I allow God to have a say in my life, when I allow him to convict me, when I stay read up in the word, when I stay prayed up, when, I, when my relationship with Jesus is how it's supposed to be, I'm not vaccinated, but I'm infected. When, when things are in the right, proper context and all of that, I'm much more happy. Because you see, it's not that I have to live with guilt when I allow his conviction in my life. It's I can live with the absence of guilt because I'm listening. That's not always true, not always the case. But it should be. Because the only way we can have true joy is to have right standing with God. Because he gets it. He's smarter than us. He's greater than us in every aspect. We need to surrender to him and his will in our lives and we can know this joy. We need to move away from a mindset of leave me alone and move to the mindset of mold me, shape me, make me what I'm supposed to be so you can use me. And for the Christian, it starts for us giving him control of our life and allowing him to convict our hearts. For the lost, it starts with finding a relationship with him and allowing him to convict your heart. So I guess the invitation is the same for the saved and the lost. I want you to ask the Lord to convict your heart. To convict your heart and to, to and I want you to allow God to have access into your heart. A lot of times we, we deny him access because, well, we, we like our sin. But we got to come back to the, the way of thinking that God is the greatest. The writer in Hebrews wants the, the people to know, wants the Christians to know, don't go back to your Jewish roots because Jesus came and he's the greatest. For us as Americans, we don't need to go back to our sinful roots. We need to come to Jesus because Jesus is the greatest. What makes him the greatest? Well, first off, he's God. He appeared to us in the form of God's son. He died on the cross for our sins, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. That's pretty great in itself. But when we look at the reason why he died on the cross for our sins was to take all our sin, all our guilt, all our punishment, all our shame. I know how bad it feels for one person's shame to be on me. There's been a time in your life where you found yourself in trouble and you felt shame over sin whatever it may be. Maybe your parents found out you were doing something terrible. You may be an adult and you can still remember the shame of your parents finding out you were doing something terrible. Maybe your pastor found out you were doing something terrible. Maybe a friend found out you were doing something terrible. You remember the shame that you felt. I can barely bear that shame. But could you imagine the shame of from the entire world falling on you all at the same time. The guilt from the entire world from sin falling on you at the same time. That's what happened to Jesus. All our sin, all our guilt, all our shame fell on him at the same time. And he held it in and he died. And when he died, it died with him. 
So you don't have to bear that guilt and that shame and that sin any longer. You still have to come to this act of giving it to him. Giving him all your guilt and all your shame. All, all, all the guilt, all the sin, all the shame. Giving it all to him. Walking away a free man. Because it's been dealt with. That's what makes him the greatest. Maybe today you're tuning in and you're like, Brother Johnny, I need the Lord to convict me because I know I'm outside of his will and I need to get rid of this guilt and this shame. Fall on your face before a living God and hand it over to him. Maybe you're listening today and you're like, I'm bearing all my guilt and all my shame because I've never been saved. I want to be saved. I want to be free from this. Fall on your face in front of a living God and confess him as your Savior. It's really simple. You just got to understand that you're a sinner. And if you come to the point where you understand your guilt and your shame, you know you're a sinner. Then you got to believe that Jesus is God's son. That he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and got up out of that grave. Repent. Turn from your sins and make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. I'd love to walk down that path and help you understand that. But today, if you want to get saved, if you need to make a decision, then you can text me your name and the, just the word decisions. You can tell me you want to get saved. You can tell me you want to join the church. You can tell me you want to be baptized. You can tell me whatever you want. Or you can just say, Brother Johnny, give me a call. Text that to 615-581-7631. Just your name and whatever decision you need to make. 615-581-7631. Or send me a message on here. However you want to do it, I'd love to help you walk through that decision. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we love you. We praise you and we thank you for all you do. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus that died on the cross for our sins that was buried. And Lord, I just ask that today, if there's anybody that's dealing with their guilt, dealing with their shame, dealing with, with dealing with all these things that you took to the cross, Father, I pray that today would be a day of surrendering those things to you and allowing you to have full control of their life. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.